As promised, I'm going to record it and post it. So going over the work we've done on pages 8 through 10, what we have, what we have is the scientific method, which is directly related to the data nugget. So I think you chose well to start with 8, 9, 10, and then move into the data nugget. I think it was a good choice. So in, on pages eight, nine, and 10, you start with a question. You start with a question. And the question is usually begins with some kind of observation. You observe something that brings you to ask a question. And that question makes you think, what could, what are the possible what are the possible answers? What are the possible answers to that question? That, that leads us to making what we call a hypothesis or an educated guess. And the key to a hypothesis is what? What is it that, what is so special about a hypothesis? It's a guess, like any other guess. It could what? It can be tested. Excellent, excellent. That, that is certainly, the, that is the thing. You hit it right in the heart of it. It's testable. It has to be testable. If it's not testable, it's not a scientific hypothesis. So we like to write it if then. This is just one way of writing a hypothesis, but we do like to write it if this happens, dot, 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 then that should happen. So what, what, I mean, what I mean by that, and the reason we say if then, is because it's ultimately very testable, very easy to see how you can test it. If the person's lying, they're twitching their nose. If the person's lying, then they're twitching their nose. They're twitching their nose, or they lied, but they didn't twitch their nose, then this hypothesis doesn't work. So it, it, you're able to say, is, you're able to say this works or it doesn't work clearly with a test that you can do in a lab or something that you can go and observe somewhere and see. And we've gone through several examples in class and we're gonna go through the data and I get today to make sure that you understand. In between there, of course, in order to ask an educated guess, you had to do research, don't forget that, that you had to do research. In this classroom, the research comes already for you in the form of your teacher or in the form of the background information. In the data nugget, they gave you all this background information. That would have been your research. Had you been in a college classroom and they told you, I need you to come up with a hypothesis on what you think is happening with global climate change or what you think is happening with the Arctic ice sheet melting, you would go to the library and spend several months re looking up all the information that they put into four paragraphs in your data nugget. That took, year, that, those four paragraphs took 50 years to develop. All right. So the next thing is you constructed your, your hypothesis. The next thing is you have to test the hypothesis. Now this is where it gets a little tricky because then there's a bunch of different groups that you need to know. So of course, we have an experiment. We have to design the experiment. We have to have an ex what's called an experimental design. And so to design the experiment, you have to know what the different variables are. Every, everybody knows from algebra that a variable can change depending on what influences are being had on any, at any particular time. So you have X and Y are not actual numbers. Usually they're a, a bunch of different possibilities. 
So in an experiment, we also have a number of variables, general variables that we, the, those variables that we control that are kept constant. Because in order to test this hypothesis, we only want to change one thing. We can only change one thing. If we go back to that ridiculous example I gave you where if they twitch their nose, they lie, then we have to keep everything else the same. We can't, we can't change the circumstances, can't like give them sneezing powder and then say he's lying. That wouldn't be any good, right? So you, got, you have to make sure that all the, all the other variables are consistent. So we, we, keep, we call these, these, these variables, they're controlled. We say they're controlled because we're controlling them. We're keeping them the same. Can someone tell me another variable that they might know? Change only one, triangle means change in science. It's a Greek letter delta. Change only one variable. In science, in all sciences, the Greek letter delta means change. That's the Greek letter delta. So variables are kept constant in an experiment uh, except the one variable that you want to change. And we usually call that the experimental variable. It's the one that we're changing, the one we're interested in. Whenever you look at any experiment on OST, ACT, some of you will be taking the SAT, ACT, you might see an experiment in there. You might see an experiment in there. Notes. Uh, you, they'll, they'll ask you to analyze it. And the first thing you do is say, okay, what, was the, what is the variable that we're interested in? What am I looking at? Something's gonna be changing. I'm going to change something, and then something's going to change that thing that I'm changing. That's what I'm interested in, because I want to see the connection between, between this and that. I want to see the connection between this and that. If I change this, then that will change, either up or down. This one I'm changing, that one changes. Does that make sense? That's one of the reasons we, I like this if-then if statement because I can look at this and then that. So we have an experimental variable that we are going to change it. We're going to change it. And we call this variable because we're manipulating it. We're going to manipulate this. Do you know what this word manipulate means? Yeah, you, that you handle it, that you manhandle it, that you change it, that you physically change it. That's what manipulate means, that you're changing it. So they, the variable we're going to manipulate, we call the independent, in, and let me change the color even, make it yellow, independent variable. So we're going to change this thing. We're going to we're going to we're going to increase the heat. We're going to decrease the heat. We're going to increase the light. We're going to decrease the light. We're going to add fertilizer. We're going to take fertilizer away. 
We're going to put antibiotics on it. We're not going to put it. You know, we're going to do, we're, cho we're choosing to do this change between all the different experimental groups. And we're going to change these, this variable. And so that's why we call it independent, because it's not dependent on anything else other than us. We're manipulating it. It's not, whatever, whatever happens is not dependent on anything but the person who's making the change. Then because you made that change, something else happens. I turned up the temperature, the egg cooked. I turned up the temperature, it bubbled. The hotter the temperature, right, the more heat I add, the more bubbles. So what is the number of bubbles in this experiment? If the heat is the independent variable, what is the number of bubbles in this experiment? Would you like me to draw it so you can see it better, cl uh, clearer, or is it too early in the morning? What's going on? Too early in the morning. Uh, well, I can't argue that. It is early in the morning, and I am also tired. It is a Monday. But if I have liquid and I'm adding heat, and I'm changing my changing my independent variable. People that did pages eight, nine, and ten should know this. My independent variable is how much heat. The amount of heat. So the more heat I add, something else happens. So I add 10 joules, I add 20, 20 joules, that's a measurement of energy, uh, 50 joules uh, per second. Every second I'm adding that many. And, so, and over here I got bubbles. Now this again is my independent variable. The amount of heat is the independent variable because I'm changing it. I'm turning up the little dial on the stove. I'm increasing the heat. What happens to the number of bubbles? You know, uh, I get some per second. I get a lot per second, and I get max per second. So what changed? Would it be easier if I used numbers instead of sum a lot? We wouldn't really count the number of bubbles, but we would capture the gas and measure the gas. So I'll say 100 bubbles per second, 200 bubbles per second, and 500 bubbles per second. So what is, the question I'm asking you is, what is this? What are the bubbles? If the heat is the independent variable, that's right. That's right. That's exactly it. So the thing that depends on the heat is called the dependent variable. So that's another, it's called the dependent variable. So that's going to be on the quiz, right? So independent, dependent. Can you tell the difference? So on the side, if I were writing Cornell notes, which you have to, and I would look at experimental design here, and I would write this question later tonight when I go home to study or when I'm at lunch with my friends, I would ask this question, can I tell the difference between independent and dependent variables. Like that's a really that's a really big deal. 
if I can tell the difference, then I'm probably going to be okay, at least on that question on the test, right? That's a big, the, and if you can tell the difference between dependent and independent, you could probably tell a lot of the other stuff that you need to know. Like you probably know what the hypothesis is, you probably know where the groups are. So what kind of groups would I have? I'd have a bunch of different groups. Me. So wait, I should stop, pause right there. I'm, I'm assuming something. I'm assuming that you understood what I said. So let me, let me, let me just ask. Is everybody okay so far? Everybody understand what a hypothesis is? What experiment, what, uh, what type, how to design it, that you need to, they have variables that you have to control, you have to keep them constant, that you're only changing one variable, right? So you need to know that you have to keep all the others constant, that you're only changing one variable, that you have an experimental variable that you manipulate, and we call that the independent variable, right? Everybody understands that? That's the one that you or the scientist that you're reading about is manipulating. And everybody understands what a dependent variable is. It's the, it's the variable that you're measuring that changes because of your variable that you're changed. Yeah, yeah. Uh, where? Yeah, that's a J. It's, it's J. It's a unit of energy. It's, it stands for joules. And it's a measurement. It's a measurement of energy. You'll learn about it in physics. I'm not going to worry about it here, OK? If that's OK with you, we just let's go ahead and take it by faith, at least at this point. That's what it is. Everybody good with that? Yeah. Over here. Yeah, you want to ask this question for yourself. Can you tell the difference between independent and dependent variables? And yeah, you could make an index card that says independent and dependent and memorize it. That helps. But really, you have to look at different experiments and be able to tell where the, which variables, because that's what I'm going to ask you on the quiz. I'm not going to, I might ask you a definition of independent and dependent. But I, I can guarantee you there's going to be an experiment, and you're going to have to decide which one of these variables is independent, which one is dependent. Are we good with that? Can you do that? Because that's what you're going to have to do on Friday. If you can't, you need to ask questions in class or see me after school or sometime. Or, uh, I'll tell you, uh, I have to meet with the chess club and the D&D &D club and find out when they want to stay after school, whatever day they want. Uh, I'll be here after school for you. Okay. Are we all good with that? Any other questions? Great questions so far. Anything else? All right. So let's take a, let's take a look. Where are you going to... I'm sorry. Remind me your name again. I keep forgetting. I'm, I'm bad with Mariah. Mariah. Well, if you're graphing the data, where would you put the independent variable? Hmm. Could you open your notebook, Mariah? So when you're, I should mention that when you're graphing your data, you want to put your independent variable here. And you want to put your dependent variable here. So what happens is that as you change the heat, Heat hotter, 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 hotter. The number of bubbles goes up. And you we're all clear that what we put here is our independent variable, and on the y you put your dependent variable. Always, that's the way you graph it. They will I can I will ask you that question. When you're graphing, you're looking independent, independent. Have you all done a best fit line? I tried. Okay, good. When you plot points, and we're going to go into graphing a little in a little bit. 
But when you're plotting points, you want to plot your points. I think everyone knows how to plot points. You go, you know, X, Y value, put a dot, X, Y value. It's when you're plotting dots. And we call this X, Y scatter. X, Y scatter. Why do you think we call it a scatter plot? That's right. Excellent. Because the dots are like scattered. Excellent. That's right. So X, X, Y scatter plot just gives us a bunch of dots on a piece of paper. That doesn't tell, I mean, you can kind of tell that this is going up, but you can't really tell how fast, right? So how do you find how fast you're going up in a graph or down? What is it called when you're going up or down on a graph? You know it. You learned it in middle school. You got it, say it. Slope, absolutely. But what do you need if you're going to find slope? That's right, you need a line. Excellent. Y equals mx plus b is the line. Excellent. Good math skills. Excellent. So we have the dots on the line. We need a line. I mean, we have a bunch of dots on paper, but we need a line. So we, we can't connect the dots. If I connected the dots, uh, I'm going to connect the dots using this yellow line. It's, look at this. Is this a straight line? No. It's not useful at all to connect the dots. Uh, in fact, I'm not even sure would they go. I think it goes this way and that way. Then that's. So, okay, so it kind of shows me a little more what's going on. A little better that it's going up, but it's still not a straight line. So what I do is there's something called regression. You don't have to know this. I'm just telling you in case you're a more advanced student or something you're into, you're going to be covering it later in, in higher level math and science anyways. But it's called regression. And there's different kinds of regression. The, all depending, oh, what happened there? That was weird. All right, so let's assume there it were, so there's different kinds of regression. There's linear regression, if you think that the pattern is a line uh, and then there's all kinds, there's exponen exponential regression, if you think it's an exponential growth curve. Uh, there's different kinds of regression. If you use Microsoft Excel, you can have Microsoft Excel do it the line, the line for you. And I'll dip, if it's a U, it'll connect, it'll do a U. If it's a straight line, it'll do linear regression, whatever. Okay, so you don't have to do any of the math. Don't worry about the math. It's a fancy word for some really, it's not really hard math, it's just a lot of numbers to keep track of. But what we can do that's easier is we can do a best fit line that's basically the same thing, but it's just kind of a guess, it's a little not as accurate. We I mean, just put the line through as many points, as close to all the points as possible. And if we do that, it would look something like this. Obviously, it would be straighter because I can't do a straight line. So That's as straight as I can do it on the paper. So it would be, it looks something like that. That's as close to the, all the points as possible. We call this, give me a second, I see your hand. We call this the best fit line. Another word for this. Uh, you'll see a lot. You'll even see it a lot in, in uh, Sheets and Excel. It's also called the trend line. It's the line on the graph that shows you the trend. It's the line on the graph that best fits all the points. Uh, in math, they would call it the linear regression. But it's a guess of the linear regression because we didn't do any calculations. Now you can do a slope. Now there's an m y equals. This does have a y equals mx plus b. This does have a slope and tells us how fast the bubbles change with the heat that we have. So it tells us a lot. Now, this is just bubbles and heat, right? That's not a big deal. But you could graph with the number of cancers and, and exposure to cigarettes. 
you could grab it with the number of cancers and exposure to HPV. You could, you could graph uh, to the crop yield with rainfall. You can do a lot of different graphs that give you a lot of how fast can we make a change if we have these data. The more data they have, the better fit your line, the more accurate your results. Are we good with this? All right. So dependent, and we'll get back, to, we'll do more of this on graphing. Will this linear regression stuff be on the test? No. Will independent be on, and dependent, independent on the X, depend on the Y, will that be on the quiz? Yes. I'm gonna highlight this in green because this will be on the quiz. You have to know that the independence on the X and dependence on the Y. Okay, let's move forward then. So we've tested the results. We have our independent. We have our data. We have our dependent, independent variables. This is part of our analysis. We can do the slope. We can do the linear regression on the data. We can calculate error. All that's good. So that, the other thing that hypothesis can do, a hypothesis can allow you to predict, a hypothesis can allow you to predict something in the future, something that has not happened before. Something hasn't happened yet. You can predict into the future. So that's really important because it allows you to predict. That's the whole point of a hypothesis in a theory. What good is science if you can't predict what's going to happen, if it's all guesswork? It's good. It is a guess, but it's a guess that allows you to predict because you've written it in the if-then statement and you've tested it. And if you test it and it's, you're confident in it, then we can, we can call it a theory. And that theory is what we think is going on until we need to improve it. So after you've experimented and you allow, and you predict it and you have enough prediction coming true, you accept it as a theory. Now, a theory is just good until it's not good anymore. A theory works until it doesn't work anymore. It's an explanation. But understand, even though it's true that not, nothing in science is proven, we're just going by what we have so far. We have, uh, it's an explanation, it's our best explanation. Our best explanation. Given all the experiments, all the hypotheses, all the predictions, this is our best guess. This is our best explanation about what's going on. Next year, somebody discovers something new, and we might have to tweak it. Maybe we have to throw out the theory. Maybe we're wrong altogether. We just, everything, everything we do in science is accept, it's, there's an accepted level of, of uncertainty. That drives non-scientists. That drives non non-scientists crazy. What do you mean you're not sure? Well, I'm sure. I'm pretty sure. We're never certain. We're never 100% certain in science. Never. Where will the bullet hit? 99% of the time, it's going to hit here. 99.999% of the time. You ever see the the DNA test for on those shows that they have? Is is this your father or not? They always say what, like 99.98% this is not the father, or 99.98% this is the father. Why not 100%? There's always uncertainty. We, scientists, when you're doing science, you're working in the real world. 
and you're assuming that there's going to be a, a, a certain amount of error in your measurement, a certain amount of error in everything you do. Even in, the, even, the, even in law, what do we see? What do we say? Do we say you have to find them absolutely guilty or not? When you're in court, what do they say in court? They don't say you have to find them absolutely guilty. What do they say? Come on, you've watched court shows. What do they say? You have to find them guilty, waiting. You have to find them guilty what? Beyond a reasonable doubt. You've never heard that before? Nah. Nah. I think you have. Beyond a reasonable doubt. You know, when someone's found guilty, they're not found guilty. When they're found innocent, they're not, no, you're, they're not innocent. They're just not guilty. When they're found guilty, they've been found guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. Is there 100%, are we 100% sure they're guilty? No. We're kind of 90, most of the time, we're like 90 plus percent, they're, they're sure they're guilty. But that's because the whole world is that way. There's nothing that's 100% sure if we're talking about the human condition. Is that understood? All right. So theory is our best explanation anywhere. Remember that a law in science is just what we see happening over and over again. Okay. Are we all good with this? So uh, we're all good with this. I can go on. Any questions, concerns, confusions, anything I hear that confuses you? This nothing here should be new to you. Now Looking at pages 12, 13, and 14, which is what the quiz is going to be, uh, another part that we talked about accuracy. Accuracy. And precision. And we said precision is something that you get the same, the same results every time or similar results every time. How close to each other are your measurements? Where accuracy is how close to the correct answer are you? If you're getting the same answer over and over again, you're very precise. If you got the right answer, then you got the right answer. You're very accurate. So if you're adding 2 plus 2 and every time you add 2 plus 2, you're getting 5 over and over and over and over again. Then you're very precise, but you're not accurate. So when you're making measurements or calculations, you want to be precise and accurate. As precise and accurate as, as you can. As precise and accurate as you can. You can't always be 100% accurate. In fact, by definition, we can't be. There's always going to be some level of error. So there's three kinds of data that they talked about in this, in the, on page 13. They talked about qualitative, and we talked about it as well. That's when you're, when you're saying, uh, when you're saying things like, is it dead or alive? Is it, 
bluish or greenish? Is it, it, they're not numbers, not numbers. And qualitative it has a little bit ambiguous. In other words, you can argue it. Science loves numbers. Why? Because we can calculate things. We can predict stuff with numbers. You can't really predict with qualitative data. Uh, qualitative data is not as useful. It's useful, and sometimes that's all we can get, but it is not as useful as quantitative data. Then there's ranked data. And we went through and did some, ex uh, some examples of this in class. Uh, so we can say things like either dark, medium, or light. That's ranked. Another example of ranked data is it's hot, medium, or cold. Also ranked. Ranked data is not, there's no number on it. There's, it can, it's in one of those three categories. It's one's higher than the other, one's lower than the other. So ranked data, again, useful, but not. Is it useful to say it's cold in this room? Is it useful to say it's hot in this room? Eh, I guess. It's still not ranked, though. Hot and cold is not ranked. It really should be hotter. Uh, colder then you're talking about ranked data all right then there's quantitative that's the goal of, of all science is to get these numbers on there that's why math is so important for you in in high school because everything out there is that I shouldn't say everything. A lot of this stuff out there is quantitative data that you need to process. There's two kinds of quantitative data. There's discontinuous and there's continuous. Discontinuous data is our numbers that they're numbers but they're not necessarily uh, in order. They're not from lowest to highest. So you, how many, how many children did your parents have? Two? Anybody else? She just had one. Anybody else? Two. How many, how many children did their parents have? Five. So it's not really continuous, is it? How many children did you have? Zero. So you went from five to two to zero. Right? Easy, 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 easy. And no, you're on you're getting taped. I'm not I'm not editing this out. So so it's all right. It is what it is. So you're gonna jump around and you're gonna go from so each generation you're gonna have different numbers, right? They're not continuous. So we call that discontinuous data. They're numbers, they help but they don't really give us numbers that we can, it limits how we can plot them and analyze them. And then of course there's continuous data, like you were, how tall you are, like height. This is number of children in a generation. Discontinuous height is a continuous. Uh, if you start measuring your height from your baby up until you are now and until you're an adult, it's going to continuously grow. It'll get incrementally, but incrementally bigger. Same with just about a lot of the a lot of the data that we try to 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 collect. Two minutes left. We will do page 12. When we get, we'll do page 12 when, uh, tomorrow.
wrap up your things, I'd like to talk to you and you, Raven, before you leave. 